Um, it's really great to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's also great to see so many um, familiar faces, including uh, some, especially the, some of my students from Reapy College House. So let's hear it for Reapy. And, and the faculty master, too. So I'm really, really happy. Very sweet of you to all show up. Uh, uh, I should also mention my sixth grade English teacher is here, back there, <laughs> which is also kind of crazy. But here we are. Anyway, I'm, I'm probably, I, I, I'm, I'm particularly glad to see you here because I imagine many of you were rolling your eyes when you first saw the, the title of, of the talk and you're thinking that, oh no, here, here we go again, uh, another talk about the humanities in crisis. Uh, and you know all those familiar arguments about uh, how the liberal arts are good for people, and and then of course I have, it has to end with saying, and you should all study Greek and Latin. Uh, well, I'm I'm actually not here quite to talk about that sort of thing, and I, I like to hear those kinds of talks, but I don't, you know, I've read a lot of these articles about this blogs and or talks on it. And I actually, a lot of good things have been said. I don't have that much to add to that particular debate. But I have been interested in the history of the debate over what constitutes the best intellectual and practical training for society. And in particular, the background to the current tension between the sciences and the humanities, terms that have become so internalized in our thinking about how we access and process knowledge of the world that they often seem to be inescapable natural categories. There's a scene in Tom Stoppard's 1994 play, Arcadia. Here we go. Some of you will know this, that captures these polarities well, where the scientist Valentin and the humanist Bernard, some of you may remember that, have the following exchange. The questions you're asking don't matter, you see. It's like arguing who got there first with the calculus. I look to my mathematics colleague. The English say Newton, the Germans say Leibniz, but it doesn't matter. Personalities, what matters is the calculus. Scientific progress, knowledge. Bernard says, really? <laughs> Why? Why what? It's a little bit like a slapstick routine. <laughs> Why does scientific progress matter more than personalities? Now, this disagreement over the very nature and ordering of what we call knowledge and its utility for those who acquire it is pretty well known. We needn't rehearse here the familiar narrative of any de in any detail of how technological specialization and changing social needs in the 20th century eventually supplanted a more holistic concept of science that prevailed in the 18th and 19th centuries. Suffice it to say that the lines between arts and sciences that were more easily crossed in those centuries between Bernard's personalities, which entail history, literature, and even psychology, and Valentine's scientific progress have become firmly and parochially etched. Even the many interdisciplinary initiatives one can point to to today, to today only rarely cross the science, non-science line. And it's still very difficult to convince scientists that their research will actually benefit from collaboration with humanists. The Stoppard's Valentine divides the world up into those who are interested in scientific facts and those interested in personalities. And he rejects personalities because they're messy. Valentine's personality suggests the fuzziness that confronts all of us in life, the complex, inconsistent, and unpredictable data we must constantly interpret as we struggle to construct meaning. Science, too, has to interpret data, but its data are held to be objective and demonstrable if they're to be considered scientific. So I'm not here to cast blame on either side of this debate. Misconceptions about what scientists and humanists do abound even in the academic community. So it's no wonder the non-academic public has such a shallow understanding of what humanist, human, humanistic research is and such a limited understanding of what it means to do good science. 
The economic crisis of the late 2000s has exaggerated this chasm between the sciences and the humanities, and within the sciences themselves, as we've all seen even, the, an anxiety about the job market has given birth to the concept familiar to many of you of the STEM fields, which of course is a coded term for scientific study that privileges practical application and implies greater employability. Science, technology, engineering, and math. It's STEM, just in case you haven't encountered that yet. It's in this climate that we see so many alarmed humanists trying to make their case for the value of what they do, fighting what seems to be an uphill battle with arguments that, for the most part, are necessarily indirect and difficult to quantify, and best assessed, you hear this and you read this a lot and you hear this in a lot of the literature about this, best assessed retrospectively after some life experience. And of course, no one wants to wait that long for results. <laughs> so how, I, I know I, I promised at the beginning not to bore you with another analysis of the state of academia today, and I'm not going to do that, but I just want to offer one observation about the current standoff between science and the humanities, which will link us then to the second century CE, or AD, depending on which you prefer, um, Greek biomedical scientist Galen. There he is in an artist's fantasy from the 17th century. Um, so he, he's going to be then our, our main, uh, my main topic for the rest of the talk. So no more about the academics today. Ever since I had to confront my own fork in the road many years ago, between a scientific and humanistic path, I've been struck and somewhat baffled by the fundamental epistemological polarization between the arts and sciences. Ironically, a term, arts and sciences, I'm in a school of arts and sciences after all, it's a term that's supposed to suggest unified, not divergent or alternative endeavors. One can certainly explain how we got here from the 18th and 19th centuries. Many will lay the blame first on the so-called linguistic turn of the early 20th century, which highlighted how dependent our, our understanding of reality is on language, and second, on how postmodernist theorists of history, the arts, and some of the social sciences expanded on this insight in the 70s and 80s. But disputes about the nature of knowledge and how or if we can access it are age-old across many cultures. Even to hold a profoundly skeptical or relativistic view about reality is still just another attempt to understand the world we inhabit. No different in its basic goal, seems to me, from the empiricist who proposes a reality that can only be measured and tested. Now, what's, what's always surprised me is the polarization itself between the sciences and the humanities. The assumption that what a scientist does and desires is at some fundamental level completely different from non-scientists. And the reason I want to bring Galen into this um, is because he was first and foremost a scientist, recognizable as such even by the most rigorous definition of our own day, and he worked at a time when the arts and sciences had not become quite so polarized as they have today. Even as early as the classical period in Greece, so this would be now the 5th to 4th century BCE, scientific and philosophical thinkers, they, they knew then, even early on, that they were doing something different from poets, historians, and sculptors. But at the same time, and some of you will be familiar with this, um, there were also philosophers who wrote in poetry. Their, their philosophical work was poetic. Parmenides, for example, or Empedocles, some of you may remember. And then, of course, on the other hand, there were historians, today kind of humanists, but historians who strove for a kind of explicit, very explicit scientific accuracy in language and trying to, get, come, you know, trying to recover a sense of the truth, of a historical truth. And here I'm thinking of someone like Thucydides, as you probably, many of you will know. Even Herodotus, who's often contrasted Thucydides, had an interest in um, precision and accuracy of, of historical truth, even though it's very difficult to, to get at. Now Galen worked in a historical period of Roman 
political domination. But all serious education in the late empire had a classical and Hellenistic Greek curriculum and bundled the wisdom of all the Greek arts and sciences from the 8th century to the 1st century BCE. It's a long swath of time. Under the grand term paideia, which means so loosely education, paideia, like our pedagogy. Um, Galen himself was a product of this holistic educational system, which included the study of Greek poetry, history, rhetoric, and philosophy. And although each did different things, they were generally regarded, at least ideally, as interrelated endeavors. I say ideally because, as we'll see in, in a minute, there were signs of change in the air as increasing scientific specialization led in some quarters, especially among doctors, as we'll see, since Galen was a doctor, to an emphasis on practical, technical, and even business skills at the expense, according to Galen, of theoretical and moral training in the non-scientific arts. Now, surely this will sound familiar to all of us as one of today's, the, the dilemmas of today's academic climate. Uh, especially the students will hear this possibly from their parents. Uh, how will studying poetry of, or Sanskrit or Greek or Italian modernism, or you fill in the blank, help me to cure patients or design a better battery? And again, you can fill in all sorts of things for these variables. Galen had, a, had various responses to this type of question for his own time, which we find here and there throughout his many works. But he evidently regarded the problem as significant enough to address explicitly in two separate treatises about the best education for doctors. So I want to spend some time then with these works, um, not just because of their inherent interest. I mean, kind of as a, as a historian and antiquarian, I'm just intrinsically interested in this. And it's very, very fascinating just in itself. But because I think Galen's contribution to the science-humanities debate, as, as we now frame it, offers some fresh insight into the issues at stake. And because his perspective, unfraught, I should say, by our sort of post-enlightenment cultural history, might help us reflect more clearly on what it means to seek knowledge and to understand ourselves and the world. Finally, I'd add, uh, in Galen we find something, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but we find something a little bit unusual um, in our own time, which is a genuine scientist offering strong advocacy for the study of arts and letters, not only as a kind of supplement to scientific studies, but as a necessary component to them. So, okay, so at this point, I know I should probably offer a little bit of background on Galen. I'm sure most of you are probably not familiar with his biography and his writings. Uh, there he is there, sort of. <laughs> um, so, um, Galen was unmistakably a, a creature of late Mediterranean antiquity uh, in the Mediterranean. Actually, I want to go to the next one. Okay, just so here is where he'd be situated here, from around 129 to around 200, roughly. We don't really know his exact birth and death dates, but this is where he is. Don't worry about what's here unless you can read it. I'm mostly concerned with the sweep of time, because when I was talking about the classical period before, this is the period, this, chronologically, this is where it would be on the timeline. And you can see that even at this, at this point, it was a kind of a revival of bundling all of the the wisdom of the classical period from here, even here. So this is a long stretch of time. It's like the difference between, for us, going back, say, to the 14th or 13th century. That's that gulf of time. Um, now, let's see if we can go maybe back to, the, to that one. Um, so he was born a Greek in 129. And in, this was in Romanized right around here, Romanized Pergamum, not on the map, but it's important to realize he was over here, which was a, under Roman domination, but he was a Greek speaker because it had been a Greek colony when it was taken over by the Romans. Um, and he spent, he spent a good bit of his career, though, in Rome, which is also important. Very cosmopolitan man. Writing voluminously, treating patients, and in, uh, patients, by the way, which included the emperors Lucius Verus, Marcus Aurelius, and then his son, the unstable Commodus, there he is in a bust, 
And however, I'm sure he'll be, this figure is more familiar to you from Gladiator fame, where you have Joaquin Phoenix playing this unstable character. And at the time, he was thoroughly embroiled in the heady polemics of contemporary science and philosophy at Rome. Now, Galen's polymathic interests and strong authorial voice were characteristic of the intellectual culture of the time, but his subsequent influence on the history of Western medicine cannot be exaggerated. I know some of the students have, have been learning this in some of their classes we talked earlier. As one recent scholar put it, quote, with the exception of Aristotle and possible exception of Plato, there can be no more historically influential ancient author in matters scientific. Indeed, the most recent attempt to edit all of his works in one edition in the 1830s, so that's not all that long ago in the grand scheme of things, in the 1830s by the German scholar, uh, doctor scholar Karl Gottlob Kuhn, was an edition intended as a textbook for medical students. Now, clearly, his impact on Western medicine was pretty profound. Now, <laughs> I promised this picture before. Th this is a, a box that arrived in the quad uh, uh, shortly before Christmas, where I had managed to snag on a great discount, 30% off, if you buy all the volumes of Galen reprinted from that 1835 edition. And here they are, you can see they're each this thick, and there are 22 of them. So they take up about that much space on a shelf when you, you line them all up. These, he wrote a lot, a lot. Um, and paradoxically, this is one of the reasons I think he's been less read and hardly can, canonical in classics, because where do you even begin, and especially when you're only dealing originally with a, a Greek text and uh, Latin, Greek text and Latin translation and this one. Very difficult. Now, that's all changing now, but um, that's for another time. Anyway, the variety and scope of Galen's output, even within the context of scientific writing, is remarkable. He wrote treatises on the kinds of topics we'd expect a Greek medical writer to take up, physiology and anatomy, of course, including several monumental works that became classics of Western medicine, one called Mixtures and the other called The Usefulness of Parts, which essentially takes you from head to toe and goes through every single uh, part of the body and, and gives a kind of teleological explanation for it. He was, by the way, as a little footnote, definitely an intelligent design person. But uh, it's also quite likely if he were alive today, he would sort of become a Darwinian, I'm pretty sure. But that's, again, for another time. Um, <laughs> He wrote on methods of diagnosis, animal dissection, prognostics, therapeutics, pharmacology, and nutrition. And he was particularly interested, this is especially good for our purposes, in you know, good science, what it meant to do good science. And this interest inspired him to write treatises on logic, scientific method, and even linguistics. Galen was a scientist who situated himself within a philosophical tradition that stretched back to Plato and Aristotle, remember our timeline, all the way back 700 years, um, 600, I guess. Um, it was a rationalist tradition concerned with the validity of logical argument and demonstration of truths about the world that followed from such arguments. As a medical scientist and biologist, Galen was an interesting mix of empiricist and theorist. He insisted on the primacy of observation and had no time for extreme skepticism about the data our senses provide. In response to skeptical thinkers of his day, he wrote in one work, here you see it here, it's a very bizarre kind of wisdom, in all honesty, a kind of stupefaction. This is kind of the way he wrote, very vituperative sometimes. When people claim some other criterion of perceptible fact prior to that of perception. Now in this, he's in an Aristotelian tradition, but he's, it's just the way he packages it as a doctor that's particularly interesting. As for people who argued that we should be mistrustful of our ears' capacity to identify sounds, or our noses to identify smells, and our sense of touch in the realm of tactile objects, is this not an interminable piece of nonsense, he says. Demonstration was also key. He wrote a long treatise on it, now unfortunately lost. Um, through uh, demonstration through anatomical experiments, mostly on animals, uh, and logical argument that began with a, a demonstrable facts about the body. 
But like the Hippocratic doctors of the classical period, again, back in the 5th century BCE, whom Galen revered, he also recognized that many physiological processes were hidden from human perception and could only be inferred from signs and symptoms. Establishing the causes of diseases or the hidden processes of the body through rigorous, mathematically precise logic. This is, Dennis, this is his term. He, geometrically precise is what he would say. Was his ideal, anyway. And one of the, his great legacies to modern medicine. Even if his premises, as we can now see, often led him down the wrong path. We can talk about that later, too. We can see, then, that Galen was about as hardcore a scientist as one could find at the time. And in terms of intellectual cast of mind and methodology, he wouldn't be out of place in any of our own science departments. It's all the more surprising to us, however, to learn about some of his other writings. He even wrote a little catalog of his many writings, <laughs> appropriately entitled, are you ready for this? On my own books. <laughs> and it, in which we find the following list at very end, he does say this to the end, after he's gone through the science -y and medical books. Here's a, his, in this treatise, he's just listing here, and then I wrote this, and then I wrote this. Okay, 48 volume dictionary of words used by the Attic prose writers, three volumes on colloquial terms in Eupolis, five on colloquial terms in Aristophanes, two on colloquial terms in Cretitis. So these, as I note up there, these are comic playwrights of the fifth century. I'm sure you know Aristophanes. These are um, contemporaries of Aristophanes. One book uh, of examples of words specific to the writers of comedy, and then a, a treatise called Whether Ancient Comedy is Useful Reading for Students, uh, six volumes to those who criticize linguistic solecisms, and one volume on whether the same person can be a literary critic and a grammarian. Okay, so, and now here's un the unfortunate truth is that none of these works has actually survived. But, um, and you can see why, I mean, it wasn't that central to the medical training of doctors after this. It kind of fell out of, out of favor, or fell out of use anyway. Um, but um, it, I, I want to go to the next, okay, good. Here's our timeline again. Um, it's clear from what he says elsewhere uh, that he was interested in philology and linguistics in the context of establishing the most accurate texts of Hippocrates. So Hippocrates wrote right around here, sorry, right around here. All those comic poets also perform writing plays in Athens right around here. And since comic poets tend to use colloquial language, and Hippocrates used a lot of colloquial language too, especially in describing um, you know, obscure um, drugs and things like that, um, he thought by studying the comic poets, we could get at Hippocrates. OK, so not all that kind of deeply poetic and deeply literary, but that's, did have, he did have an interest in it. It, it suggests a, a connection in his mind, although it suggests a connection in his mind between philology and medical scholarship. His interest in what was, by his time, called classical literature also took him into realms that seem still, even still far removed from what we would call pure science. And what's striking, I think, and instructive for us is just how comfortably he could travel among a variety of disciplines, finding natural points of contact among them. Now, two works survive in which Galen directly addresses his belief in a broad, inter- and multidisciplinary training. And it's, these are the ones that I want to turn to now. The first is one of those titles that kind of says it all, and you saw it in the title of our talk today, The Best of Do Doctor is Also a Philosopher. Many medical schools today now have departments of bioethics, and bioethicists are typically trained as philosophers, so we perhaps have some intuitive sense of what was on Galen's mind here. But there are some idiosyncrasies about his perspective which are worth examining. Uh, Galen was moved to write The Best Doctor by his discontent with the medical culture of his day. Specifically, he identifies three interrelated problems. The first, <laughs> Doctors pay lip service to Hippocrates, he says, but are too lazy to actually reach his level of expertise. Two, because they don't follow Hippocrates properly, they lack training in logical theory. And three, what he, call, what he calls the bad upbringing current in our times, <laughs> which encourages people to value wealth over virtue. For, as he asserts, 
It's impossible to pursue financial gain at the same time as training oneself in so great an art as medicine. Someone who's really enthusiastic, this is still him saying, speaking, someone who is really enthusiastic about one of these aims, money or medicine, will inevitably despise the other, he says. The general contours of this argument are conservative and predictable. The current generation no longer engages adequately with the greats of the past. No one wants to work as hard as people in the good old days. And the focus is now only on money and on and on. We've heard this one many times in our, our own time, and especially in discussions of waning interests in the humanities. Galen's complaint is in a similar vein and rests on his belief that one can only be a good doctor if one has had a broad, rigorous education that molds not only the intellect but also one's character. What's distinct and interesting about his position in this work, I think, is how easily he interweaves the scientific, <coughs> scientific with the ethical. He lists very concretely how the study of philosophy will make one a better scientist and medical practitioner. You could follow here. It provides the foundations for knowledge of the body's very nature, which is to be understood on three levels. First, he's getting down and dirty here. The level of the primary elements, by which he means the hot, the cold, the wet, and the dry, is kind of principles, but you can't really see them, which are in a state of total mixture with each other. Second, the level of the perceptible, which is also called the homogeneous, and here he just, these are just Greek terms for things that you can, you can see and touch, like blood, things that come become a kind of recognizable thing, blood, flesh, and bone. And then thirdly, the kind of next step is organs, which are also kind of homogeneous. Um, the use and function for the animal of each of these is also a lesson of the logical method, use and function, very key to him. Um, they, too, should be learned by a process of rigorous demonstration, not uncritically. Science and medicine, however, as Galen realizes, are practiced in the context of human desires and needs, and so always within some sort of moral context, as he makes clear in, when he sums up. The doctor must be practiced in logical theory in order to discover the nature of the body, the differences between diseases, and the indication as to treatment. He, and here we go. He must despise money and cultivate self-control in order to stay the course. He must therefore know, know all the parts of philosophy, the logical, the physical, and the ethical. In that case, there will be no danger of his performing any evil action since he practices self-control and despises money. All evil actions that men undertake are done either at the prompting of greed or under the spell of pleasure. How well we know this. <clears throat> and so he's bound to be in the possession of the other virtues too, for they all go together. Those of you who are philosophers here will recognize Plato in, the, in here. It's impossible to gain one without acquiring all the others as an immediate consequence. They are connected as if by one string. Very platonic. As we can see from these passages, the, term Greek, the Greek term philosophy includes a broader array of pursuits than our own philosophy. In our own time, we tend to separate off the, the study of the physical world from the ethical and the metaphysical. Any scientist today would doubtless embrace Galen's claim that good science implies logical thinking, but he's calling for a more focused and theoretical training in logic than most scientists tend to get. The doctor who understands logical theory Galen holds will better understand the physical world, biology, uh, physiology, environment, things like that, and at the same time will more likely know how to act virtuously. And he continues, don't let anyone tell you that a doctor can be ethical without being a philosopher. Uh, one needs to study ethics first, he claims, before one can actually be virtuous. As he says, a little, a little kind of squib here. I hope that no one's going to quibble over words and come out with some nonsense saying, for example, that the doctor should of course be above monetary matters, but be a just man, and, and be a just man, but still not a philosopher. And I mean, he goes on a little bit more, just basically say, it's not the strongest argument, but saying, you know, you can't, you can't know how to be a good philosopher until you're a virtuous doctor, until you've been trained in philosophy first. Now, philosophy, of course, is only one branch of what we call the humanities today. And many philosophers now are even moving away from traditional humanistic questions and closer to the sciences. 
Such philosophers would certainly approve of Galen's obsession with logic and syllogistic precision, and I know we have a logician in the audience here, um, but probably contest his insistence that logic and ethics are necessarily implicated with one another. The situation gets even more interesting when, in another treatise, Galen urges doctors to study all the arts. This work, called An Exhortation to Study the Arts, <laughs> surprise, surprise, is a fascinating document from an era when the borders between intellectual disciplines were more permeable than they are in our own day. At the same time, it's clear from this work that there were plenty of doctors in the second century CE who were content to work in a kind of specialist isolation that Galen disapproved of. So okay, let's look a little more closely at his perspective in, uh, on arts and sciences then in, in this treatise. Now what I love so much about this work is that Galen is not embarrassed, as we often are, um, to begin with fundamental questions about what it means to be a human being in the first place, as opposed to some other creature, some other animal. The very first sentence of the work uh, begins with musings about a problem we still haven't really resolved. Do I have that here? Yeah. Um, Oh, no, sorry, we'll get to this in a minute. Anyway, the, f the first sentence of this, this is coming a little bit later, goes like this. It's not clear whether so-called dumb animals are, in fact, entirely devoid of reason. That's the first, the opening sentence. Just great. I said, wow, just get right to it. Um, he's willing to allow that animals have something resembling reason, even if they don't have the capacity for verbal expression. But curiously, he's less interested in language and uh, as a boundary marker between the human and, and the, and the non-human or the animal, and more impressed by the human capacity for performing and learning a variety of what, he, what we're translate as arts, or these techni. We'll come back to that in a sec. And here's, here's what he says here. The crucial difference between animals and man, though, is seen in the great variety of arts which this latter animal performs, and from the fact that man alone has the capacity for knowledge. He can learn whichever art he wishes. So, the Greek word for art, techne, it probably many of you are familiar with this, um, but it's, it's if, even if you've never heard it before, you can hear it in the word technology and technical and things like that. Um, for a Greek of this period, the term had a much wider scope than it does for us today. It included not only crafts and certain physical skills, but also, and of more, kind of more interest to Galen, all the intellectual practices and skills that benefit humanity. Galen refers to those, that particular category, as he calls these the divine arts, the divine techni, which he valued more highly than more artisanal arts. He would include in this group geometry, astronomy, natural science, and of course medicine. Sound good. But also poetry, music, and at the top of his list, philosophy, which he calls the greatest of divine goods. All of these are united as arts, according to Galen, by the fact that, we, that they are all, he considers them what we would translate as useful to life. The Greek word is biophiles, useful, sort of like life friendly. Is, is how you might translate that, but it's translated as useful to life. And he distinguishes these, these true arts from those <laughs> useless or wicked arts, or wicked practices, which, are, which he says are sometimes called arts. And you would be maybe be surprised what he lists as these. Okay, here are the, um, his examples of useless or wicked arts. <clears throat> Acrobatic activities, <laughs> such as tightrope walking, or very important one, spinning in a circle without becoming dizzy. <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> Using grand metaphors and imagery, he continues by dividing humans into two conceptual groups with two, we would call them two patron saints. I'm not sure what he would call them. But two different groups, two different patron saints. Those who follow the goddess, now this is translated a number of ways. I'm going to translate it as chance. Sometimes people like to make it sound more familiar and they call it fortune. Sort of, it kind of means chance, though. Those who follow the goddess chance, and then those the, on the one hand and the other, those who follow Hermes, 
a God whom Galen refers to as the Lord of the Word, or Logos. We'll come back to that. And Lord of the Word and practitioner of all art, all techne. The followers of fortune, or chance, live random, unpredictable lives, largely devoid of reason, while the followers of Hermes are devoted to the literary and scientific arts, especially the high and rational arts, as Galen calls them, in order to distinguish them from the less desirable, so the, the workmanlike arts, which exercise the body rather than the mind. So the mind is definitely putting on a higher plane for these arts. Now, the moralizing throughout is rather predictable and kind of heavy-handed, but it's pretty vivid. The followers of chance turn out to be mostly wealthy people obsessed with money, surprise, surprise, after we've seen it in the last treatise, um, or, interesting, obsessed with family pedigree. That also bothers them. Galen describes the followers of chance as consisting of <laughs> demagogues aplenty, courtesans and catamites and betrayers of friends, and there are also murderers, grave breakers, and robbers, and quite a few of them have not even spared even the gods, he said, but have pillaged their altars too. In other words, these people who throw themselves to the whims of chance have no moral foundation, he believed, because they'd not exercised the, um, the intellect or reason, and had no interest in knowledge or cultivating any of the pursuits that distinguish us from animals who live similar lives of randomness. But it's his particular description of the followers of Hermes that I find most interesting for our inquiry today into the nature and, um, for our, sorry, for our inquiry into the nature uh, and relevance of the arts to human life. Galen offers a graphic, idiosyncratic imagining of these followers of Hermes, and though it's a mere caprice, probably even for him, it speaks to the specific ways in which Galen finds that all the higher arts relate to one another, kind of like the virtues. He imagines the followers of Hermes gathering around the god in this one, and nearest the god, forming a circle around him, are geometers, mathematicians, philosophers, doctors, astronomers, and scholars. And after them, the second band, painters, sculptors, grammarians, carpenters, and architects. And after them, the third order, all the other arts. That's third. Each is drawn up in his individual place, but they all fix the god with the same constant look, obedient to his bidding. You will find here too many who actually stand with the god a sort of fourth rank, but you can tell that the writing is very, Galen Wright wrote very fast, as you could tell, and, and probably dictated it mostly. So this is almost like this weird afterthought or a footnote, because you would think that this is now becoming the most important thing, but he's been going down. You should have this as number one, but it's kind of occurring to him, almost stream of consciously. A sort of fourth rank picked out from the others, the contemplation of this band and of its character will, I fancy, conduce to emulation and indeed adoration. Okay, now who's in this fourth group? Socrates is among them, and Homer, Hippocrates, and Plato. All classical figures except for Homer, who's even earlier. He's an archaic figure, even before them, or back in the 8th century BCE, as well as their lovers, so people who had, who I mean, lo lovers not in the literal sense, but fans. They're fans. Um, these are people to be revered like gods as they are the gods' deputies and attendants. So this small inner, inner circle here. For Galen, then, in other words, there are no arts and sciences. There are only the arts, the techni. Sets of practices which can be taught and learned systematically and benefit mankind in one way or another. He recognizes a hierarchy of the arts to be sure, as his image of the circular bands around Hermes suggests, but this is not a hierarchy based on a notional divide between science and non-science. Mathematics and astronomy are, in, are indeed in the first band closest to the god, and painting and sculpture come in the second tier. But we should note as well that included in the inner sanctum that we just talked about, in that separate fourth rank, um, a very special people who are closest to Hermes and themselves godlike, we find none other than the poet, Homer, whose techne produced epic fictions, as you all know, epic fictions of heroes, mythology, magic, and fantasy. Now, Galen didn't believe in any way that poetry and science were doing 
the same thing. But for him, they were both connected at the highest level because they were both essential for the, hum, uh, for the improvement of the human condition. Poetry was essential because it was exemplary. People learn from poetry morally, aesthetically, and philosophically because it represents facets of the world we inhabit. Um, a, a world of relationships and emotions as well as material things. Proper, precise scientific inquiry was also useful for life, to use that term, as Galen would say. But, but in his mind, it could not be accomplished by scientists who were not properly trained in the other arts, including the literary, because they would not then have the character suited to do science properly. This accounts for Galen's constant disdain for venal doctors who are only in it for the money or obsessed with, with vanity or pleasure seeking, as we saw. It's not only that such behavior might seem unbecoming for a good citizen. I mean, there's that, there is that sense of decorum that probably underlines this as, as from his own kind of cultural upbringing. Um, it's not only that, but it distracts a person from doing good science because in his mind, Galen's mind, it taints one's motivations for empirical objective research in the first place. We hear similar arguments today from bioethicists, for example, concerned that doctors with no background in philosophical, indeed humanistic, thinking are often ill-equipped to make sound judgments about the very difficult ethical dilemmas that constantly arise in, in modern medicine. Well, so I don't, I'm not gonna, gonna, I'm wrapping up now so we can have a discussion, but I don't, I don't actually want to, contrary to what you may be thinking, I don't want to pretend that reading Galen is gonna solve all of our problems which are naturally idiosyncratic to our own time. But it might be useful for us to approach our current dilemmas with a, you know, a modestly Galenic perspective. The key, I think, lies in his characterization of the god Hermes as lord of the logos the, and practitioner of every art. The Greek word logos is one of those loaded words in, you know, with, with multiple meanings it can mean a word, it can mean logic, it can mean reason. But his point here is that the pursuit of knowledge in any realm requires, and here's another, the two other meanings of the word, requires calculation and communication. Both concepts easily conveyed by, by logos in Greek. Further beyond that, uh, some other terms like precision, words we use, precision, and clarity, all of these are bundled up in that one word, logos. These are all concepts that we easily associate with science, but in fact they apply to the study of humanities as well. The historian's desire for accuracy, we talked about earlier, is no different from the physicists. And even though they may have to settle for different levels of, of truth, it's still there. It seems to be a kind of a common pursuit motivation. Finally, Galen's simplistic moralizing may seem a bit quaint to us in the context of our much more complex societies, but we still believe, I think, that our academic curricula are in some sense directed towards the formation of character. It's good we have the college dean here. Um, whatever we mean by that exactly, I mean, we can debate that, but we do, I think most of us who are faculty here, some level, think about formation of character, even though that sounds like a quaint phrase. Again, it may embarrass us to speak in these terms, but perhaps we should take a note, we should take note of how Galen, in an era when it also seemed as if the arts and sciences were beginning to drift apart, makes an actual argument for the importance of integrating all areas of knowledge within a holistically conceived curriculum. Galen wanted scientists, as we do, not only to be technically competent specialists, we certainly want that, but also morally responsible ones. And this is the promise, I think, offered by emulating the followers of Hermes. And with that, I'll leave it. Thank you.